Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Kent City Council Committee of the Whole Meeting. Today is Tuesday, May 25th, 2021. This is a remote meeting due to the COVID-19 health and safety requirements and by order of the governor. So welcome to anyone that is joining us on Facebook Live today, the uh, Kent TV 21 channel, the YouTube Kent TV 21 channel, and anyone that is calling in this afternoon to join us. We will go ahead and get started with the first item on our agenda, and that is the roll call. Kim, will you please call the roll? President, Council President Troutner. Here. Council Member Voice. Council Member Fincher. Here. Council Member Core. Here. Council Member Larmer. Here. Council Member Michaud. Here. Council Member Thomas. Here. Thank you. Great, thanks, Kim. Welcome, everyone. We will move on to approval of the agenda. Are there any changes from council or staff? No changes this afternoon. All right, we will continue on then with department presentations. The first item is the payment of bills, which everyone receives that in email. So if there, um, everyone is okay with that, we will move that on to the consent calendar. And then next up, I will welcome Paula Painter to talk about the U.S. Department of Treasury Coronavirus Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, and this does require action by council. Welcome, Paula. Thank you, Council President Troutner and members of City Council. So today I am here to chat with you a little bit about the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, as you know, back in March, um, this plan, this ARP, what we call ARPA, was signed into law, which three, which um, ultimately means $350 million um, of emergency funding will be um provided to eligible organizations. And with those monies, um, we'd be able to use our portion of those monies for things like public health expenditures and negative economic impacts that have helped happened because of that, um, loss of revenue for the city, as well as investment in infrastructure, um, water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. And as you might recall, the city has put together a committee um, to set to up some framework for how to spend those dollars and what kind of buckets to be able to um, utilize um, uh, when determining what to do with those dollars. But, but first, we actually have to get our hands on the dollars. So what is in front of you right now is the ultimately the permission to be able to sign the documents we need so that we can receive from the federal government the 28 point, almost $2 million that the city is um, um, eligible to receive. It will be coming in two um, disbursements. The first half would come in 2021, and then about a year later, we'd see that second half. Um, and then I do know that the ARPA committee have been meeting and they plan the proposal that's going to come forth from that group will be coming to the committee of the whole on June 8th. And at that point, um, you'll hear what work was was done with that committee. This one is ultimately just allowing the city to be able to accept these dollars. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. Great, thank you, Paula. Does anyone have any questions about this piece? I know we'll probably have some questions when we have that presentation, but this is just that first step in being able to accept the money. So is everyone okay moving this forward to consent calendar? Perfect, that was easy, Paula. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next up, we're just gonna have some information from Haley Bonsteel on the House Bill 1220. Hi there, everyone. Um, I am in the interesting position tonight of interpreting a, a new statute for you. And uh, we are in close collaboration with our colleagues in law, but it, it's a little bit of a funky one. So I don't have a lot of answers tonight. So if you have questions, I'm probably in the same boat as you, but I did wanna just let you know uh, what's going on with this bill and that we may need to take some action. So. Um, House Bill 1220, uh, the sort of tagline for it was supporting emergency shelters and housing through local planning and development regulations. And it was signed by the governor 
um, this month. However, I did see actually just this afternoon that a section of it was vetoed. So one of my bullets will be um, crossed out uh, verbally because um, it turns out that not all of it went through. So the bill had a few different components. It's that last bullet that we can now ignore because that was vetoed, but I'm going to go through some changes to comprehensive planning requirements, uh, some new regulations on transitional housing, permanent supportive housing, indoor emergency shelters, and uh, that's really the bulk of what I want to talk to you about. And then there's also just a few little miscellaneous things at the end, uh, new definitions and things like that. So I've got the bill sponsors listed at the bottom there. You can see it's a, a veritable who's who of um, housing interested legislators. And I'll say that, you know, I think the intent here is to remove barriers for types of housing that are seen as crucial to helping us um, work through the housing crisis and, and get people uh, into safe situations. However, as is often the case, uh, really good intentions don't necessarily translate to really uh, cleanly written bills. So we have a little bit of decision making to do uh, coming up, not tonight, but in the future to figure out how exactly we want to interpret um, these regulations. And I think that many cities will be in the same boat because it's, it's, it's a bit unclear. So let's start with the new comprehensive planning requirements. Um, the Obviously, the comprehensive plan is not something we're doing right now. So this is, doesn't feel to me like something we need to necessarily act on at the moment. This is more an FYI for comprehensive plan process, which will be probably a big work plan item for next year in 2023, since it's due in 2024. But basically, the housing element of the comprehensive plan will now be required to identify the number of units necessary to manage projected growth, including for um, moderate, low, very low, and extremely low income households, as well as emergency housing, shelters, and permanent supportive housing. Now that's very interesting because those more transitory types of housing, such as shelters, are not something we have typically um, projected growth for. And so what's interesting is that the bill appears to say that the Department of Commerce will provide these numbers. Now we have no idea what that methodology will be, whether we will have input to that. Obviously, if we're able to participate in any way, we will certainly um, endeavor to do that. But it's um, it's kind of an interesting charge for commerce. I, I don't envy that because I think that's a really tricky um, thing to try to wrap the mind around. But hopefully they have more uh, creativity about it than I do at the moment. So there's also some other considerations for the comprehensive plan related to middle housing, um, discriminatory policies, anti-displacement. All of those should flow very well from our Kent Housing Options Plan that um, is our next item to discuss tonight. So assuming that council moves forward with that, I think we'll have a really good basis for considering those items in the next comprehensive plan. And in fact, we'll have done a lot of the work already. Um, but that, that first one's gonna be interesting. So if you have questions about it, again, I probably share them. I don't have any answers right now, but that is what is in the bill. So let's talk about the new regulations on a couple different types of housing. First, we're gonna talk about indoor emergency housing slash shelter. So the definitions in the law differ slightly from how Kent City Code identifies them, but our, our definitions are not incompatible. So the important thing here to remember that we're talking about is indoor emergency shelter or indoor emergency housing, which we um, currently stipulate at that side of sort of 90 day on, 90 day off kind of uh, rotation. And we have a number of, of regulations and I'll summarize some of them in a moment, but essentially effective September 30th, we can't prohibit them in any zone in which hotels are allowed unless we have an ordinance on the books. Um, so that would be is that happening in the next few months, authorizing indoor shelters in the majority of zones within one mile proximity to transit. The map shows what one mile proximity to transit looks like in Kent. And you can see that it's all of Kent. Um, it doesn't say, the law doesn't say high capacity transit or light rail transit or anything like that. So we're really talking about every single bus stop. And if you measure a mile for every single bus stop, you get the whole city. So that would mean that we would have to look at the majority of zones in the city. Now we have uh, approximately 26 zones. And so the majority of that would be 14. Now today we allow hotels in just eight zones. So we kind of have a choice here, especially with the September 30th deadline of, do we allow indoor emergency housing in the zones where we allow hotels today, which does include downtown and Midway, um, or do we choose 14 of our 26 zones and try to come up with some selection criteria for that to make sense? Um, you know, we have approximately five single family zones, six multifamily zones, you know, three industrial, four commercial, something like that, uh, 
four or five mixed use. So it, it's a little bit, um, I, I'm not sure what our selection criteria would be, but that is our other option besides allowing the September 30th deadline to come and go and having um, emergency, indoor emergency housing be allowed in the eight zones where hotels are allowed today. So the other piece related to these indoor um, housing facilities is this idea of reasonable requirements. So um, cities may impose reasonable, quote unquote, occupancy, spacing, and intensity of use requirements. This is one of those examples where I really wish we knew what was in people's minds because what is reasonable? It's just totally in the eye of the beholder. So it's this is untested. We don't really know what will count as reasonable. The metric that's given in the law is that you, we may impose reasonable requirements as long as they don't prevent the siting of a sufficient number necessary to accommodate that projected need, which we'll get from commerce in several years. So we won't know yet whether we are preventing the siting of a sufficient number. So it may be the kind of thing where we have to adjust it over time. We'll make a you know, determination about what's reasonable now. We'll see what our projected number is and whether that needs to change. There might be some kind of monitoring that happens at some point by someone besides us. Who's to say? Um, our existing regulations, which were adopted just a year ago, as you may remember, um, they may not need to change uh, to comply with our read of this law because in terms of reasonability, that's a difficult metric to know whether we would meet, but you know, we didn't base them on nothing. They were based on existing models that operate in Kent. Um, they, you know, they had to be spaced at a thousand feet, provide some documentation of proposed staffing and operational characteristics, you know, have a site plan, kind of relatively basic stuff. But again, it's just really, it's a little bit difficult to know how um, other folks would see that in terms of reasonability. So um, our, our shelter regulations, the outdoor regulations, um, you know, had a strong basis in Seattle King County public health requirements, but our indoor regulations were more based on existing models um, that, that, you know, already exist in Kent. And so it's just a little bit um, tough to say how, you know, how this will all play out. So again, lots of questions, not exactly a lot of answers. That's indoor shelters and housing. Now let's talk about permanent supportive housing. So this is the other type of housing that is specifically addressed in the statute. And that is, this one is not as much addressed in our code. The statute, I should also mention, lists transitional housing. Um, that's a model of housing that, uh, or of shelter rather, that is kind of not really funded anymore. So we're not too concerned about that piece. And we already have transitional housing in our zoning code. So we'll probably include it in any update we do just to take care of it. But I wanted to talk to council about things that might actually happen <laughs> based on this statute and not just um, words that exist in the bill. So permanent supportive housing is something that um, I think we're all probably aware that it's happening. So let's talk about it. I know that council member core um, was at the housing development consortium webinar that I was also at that was sort of a intro to permanent supportive housing. So, um, and others may also have experience with this housing type, but what's interesting is that the statute defined it um, very clearly and the definition is kind of up here. It's subsidized, it's leased, there's no limits on length of stay. It prioritizes people who need comprehensive support services. It's easier to get into a lease, so there's fewer criteria related to your criminal history, your personal behavior, your rental history, and it's paired with on-site or off-site voluntary support services designed to, and I'm quoting here from the bill, support a person living with a complex and disabling behavioral health or physical health condition who was experiencing homelessness or who was at imminent risk of homelessness. So that's how the statute defines it. Now you'll notice there is nothing about the structure of the building in this definition, right? This is a very like who is being served, who's living in the building. So on the next slide, I have a kind of what is it really though? Because I think we're all probably familiar with what permanent supportive housing looks like in practice partly because we have one right here in Kent. So the Thea Bowman Apartments, that's on the top, um, built by Catholic Community Services in our Midway area, is the first permanent supportive housing community in Kent. And, you know, it's basically a mixed-use or multifamily building. Um, and and that seems to be what, much, what many of them are. On the bottom is the affordable housing community that is planned, or the permanent supportive housing community that's planned for Burien. I actually just read this afternoon that Burien voted to delay it in some way. I think it's coming in under a special um, demonstration project, which might be why there's a, a different regulatory thing and it's not just getting its permits normally. 
So the council had some kind of decision to make. I'm not clear on what it was, but whatever it is, they chose to delay it, which is interesting. We'll have to see how that plays out. But what I'm trying to get out here is that permanent supportive housing in reality appears to be basically multifamily. So we considered the Theo Bowman apartments when they came in to be multifamily. We didn't create a new zoning category for this type of housing because fundamentally it's people living permanently the way that, you know, anybody might live in any apartment building. So let's talk about the new zoning requirements because I think what's interesting here is that I have a feeling many cities will choose to regulate permanent supportive housing separately from multifamily because of these new zoning requirements. So let me tell you what they are and then tell you why I think we might want to not do that. <laughs> so cities cannot prohibit permanent supportive housing in any zone in which residential dwelling units or hotels are allowed. So let's just sit with that for a moment and think about that. We can't prohibit essentially a multifamily building in any zone in which dwelling units, which includes single family zones, <laughs> Um, or hotels, which includes industrial zones, are allowed. So the, I just kind of touched on the two issues that I put at the bottom, which are, you could interpret that to say we have to allow multifamily and single family. Now, I can't imagine that was the intent of the folks writing this bill, because people have tried to um, take apart single family zoning and state law in lots of different ways, and they've never been successful. And I kind of doubt that someone just skated this under and nobody noticed. I, I think that, um, you know, it's likely that they're thinking of multifamily zones or that permanent supportive housing is not necessarily multifamily. So I'll touch back on that in a moment. The other piece is this idea that, you know, hotels are allowed in areas that we don't consider to be suitable for long-term living. We consider hotels to be acceptable for a short stay in an industrial area, but not a long stay. So I really would love to sit down with the legislators and ask them about this because I think that's a really curious um, decision. That said, that's probably not going to happen. Um, what I want to point out, though, about this idea of, you know, is it multifamily or is it not? You know, to me, the only difference between multifamily and permanent supportive housing as it exists in reality is like the life circumstances of residents and their source of income. So regulating it separately from multifamily, to me, seems potentially almost like discriminatory, which obviously that's up to lawyers to decide, not me. But it really doesn't make sense from a land use perspective to call this something special. It's housing. It's housing for people. So it really, to me, makes the most sense. Not that my opinion is necessarily the one that's going to um, take us through to the end here, but just to put it out there that, you know, this, this probably should fit into existing housing types more so than be called out separately, considering that all of the things about the definition were really just about um, who's living there. So I have a few things that um, are my like beginning of a semblance of an answer to any of this. None of them are final, but there are things that we're exploring. We're exploring whether permanent supportive housing needs a separate definition for multifamily. I, I am hopeful that we can find a way through this where it doesn't personally, because from a, again, from a land use architecture built environment perspective, I don't, I don't see that. Um, and what we're considering is, is there a way to potentially expand the group home definitions, which group homes are allowed in single family zones, um, to accommodate the concept of permanent supportive housing as it's defined in the statute. So that way we're not talking about adding a whole bunch of density to single family zones, which again, cannot be what they meant, <laughs> but that is sort of what a, a straight interpretation of the law would suggest. So that's one of our ideas for how to potentially allow essentially housing that some that is being paid for in a unique way. Um, you know, if someone comes up with a, a way to do that under a group home scenario where it's six people in a house and someone else is paying the rent, um, you know, it is that fundamentally different than something else that's happening in a in a single family zone. So obviously, lots of questions still on those. Um, the legality of allowing multifamily, including permanent supportive housing, this is something we're exploring. What if we only allowed it in um, zones that allow hotels where there is currently a hotel? So is that too limited to say, yeah, sure, you can build it in our industrial zone, but only where there's a hotel today so that hotels could be converted, but we wouldn't see a whole lot of new housing. Um, and part of the reason for that is this last bullet. I have not heard from anyone on PSRC. I've kind of asked around a little bit. Does PSRC have any concerns about our MIC designation if we allow housing in an industrial zone because hotels are allowed there? You know, we don't want to remove the possibility of hotels locating in our high value industrial areas 
So if hotels are allowed there, then now suddenly housing can be allowed there. That seems like PSRC will have an issue. So that's not on us to figure out. That's really on PSRC. Um, but I, you know, we may want to be the ones to kind of bring it up with them. So I'm that's something else that we're exploring. So those are the hardest parts of the bill. This last slide is just um can be half ignored because that last whole piece about ADUs was vetoed by the governor. So the only real piece here is that they defined moderate income as 120% of AMI. And I do think it's worth just looking at those numbers because when we are talking about these different um, types of housing and the different projections that we need to do, 120% of AMI is 95,000 for a single person or between 108,000 and 135 for a, a smaller family. So that is now considered moderate income. And those are just numbers for 2021. So those will update every year, but that's just um, maybe helpful information as we think about what uh, the comprehensive plan requirements will be and not to mention our next presentation. So with that, I'm that's all I have. I was about to say, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm happy to hear your questions. I may not be able to answer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Haley. Anyone have any questions about this right now? There's a lot of information. Um, Councilmember Larmer. Thank you. Thanks, Haley. You, you did such a great job keeping us up to date and informed about all these um, really complicated <laughs> statutes and policies. Um, yeah, I just want, you know, it's more, I guess, a statement than a question. You know, I, I share your concern about putting long-term housing in industrial zones. To me, that just feels like there's some health implications there. You know, what what does that do um, to be, you know, permanently living in some of this this heavy industrial area? Um, so that's a concern I have. And then in the with the idea of Multi, uh, defining them differently than multifamily, do you think that they're trying to prevent any type of discriminatory action by by trying to call it out differently? Or because it seems to me that there'd be less discrimination, as you stated, by just kind of ignoring what, you know, what defines the residence and just calling it multifamily based on the building type. Um, but I'm just wondering if you think that they're trying to maybe go at some sort of anti-discrimination measure. A good, I, 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 I can't really say for sure. I would say that the reason they're calling it out is because it's a new model. And it, it, it almost seems like it's coming from the other end of, um, you know, formerly what might have been mandatory services on site or somewhat institutional type of housing. I, I'm, my feeling is that they're trying to define this middle zone between that and any old apartment building and say, hey, this is the new thing. We're going to get funding for this. This is what's going to help a lot of people get off the streets without a lot of barriers. And um, my, my sense is that that is the purpose of defining it separately is to try to make this middle ground a little more clear. But I, I, it's an interesting point, council member. I'm not sure. Um, I, yeah, I can't, I, I can't speak to what was in their minds, but it's interesting. I, I don't know how to answer that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Council member Cora, did your question get asked or answered? I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, um, yeah. All right. And you know, um, council member Fincher, go ahead. Thank you. Just looking ahead and thinking about King County's plan with the hotels, how would this impact that? Uh, would it widen the zones? It sounds like to me it would widen the zones and they could uh, then also place their shelters that they would want any place. Would, would that be the case? Another great question. Um, you know, I don't have a direct line to what's in the minds of the county, but I will say that another bill that got passed identified some major funding for the operations and maintenance of permanent supportive housing. So I think it was 1277 or it ended with a seven. Um, that suggests to me that there is like a, definitely a strategy in place to um, build or convert and get the funding for operations and maintenance and just permanently own buildings. So I know that for instance, King County recently purchased a, a hotel in Queen Anne and is converting it to permanent supportive housing. So I think, you know, there's a separate question of the, the shelter piece. Um, 
I, it, you know, I don't know if the county is going all in on shelters or all in on permanent supportive housing, or if they're splitting, you know, their their resources between those things. But um, it's that's another good question that I I don't have a clear answer to. And as far as tiny homes, would they fit under what they're now trying to say is the permanent supportive? Um, that's another good question. Uh, again, I think that most people think of permanent supportive housing as being enclosed in a building. So I would say that I wouldn't expect it to, but what you're picking up on, council member, is that that definition does not say anything about the structure. So they could potentially um, all any collection of dwellings or uh, or any type of building, if they lease rooms to humans, um, you know, subs in a subsidized way, and there's voluntary on-site or off-site, you know, all these things. They could call that permanent supportive housing. I, I think the direction is towards multifamily, but that is not you, what you describe is not um, incompatible with the statute. Thank you, Haley. I'm Haley. You know, I, there was a mention of uh, permanent supportive housing in the valley, and we've done so much work so far to you know wrap ourselves around that vision that we have for Rally the Valley and what we want that to look like downtown. And this just doesn't seem to support that um, as far as that particular area. So I'll be interested in where that conversation goes and what information we find out about that. Yeah, I will be sure to come back uh, soon. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't see any more hands raised. Um, so we will move on to the next topic, but I know we'll be hearing back from you um, as your team kind of get some answers to those questions and gets more information that um, tells the story a little bit better. So um, we will move on to the next item, which is the um, Kent Housing Option Plan, better known as KHOP, and this requires action. Thank you so much. And I did want to point out that I'm wearing my missing middle housing shirt in case <laughs> the whole thing going on here. This is my find of the last year that I've been waiting for this moment to be able to share with you all. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'm really pleased to be here. I know I'm joined by my colleague, Kayleen. We have just been um, so excited to, to come to this final step here with KHOP or near, near final. And so um, we're very much hoping that uh, the council will be able to move this forward tonight. Um, I'm stalling a little bit because I'm seeing the slides um, not totally happening uh, over there. So um, I know you're all very familiar with this project and we've been talking about it with you a lot. We are going to try not to go over every single detail of it, even though we're very excited with how it all turned out. Um, but we are, we do want to make sure that everybody knows what they are taking action on this evening. So we're going to go through um, bit by bit, you know, just a, a high level overview of what is in this document because it's, you know, hundred pages long and it's got another two or 300 pages of appendices. And we realize that that is, um, just a lot for anybody who has a life at all. So uh, we're going to talk this evening about um, each. Okay, I think I've, I think I finally spelled enough about each piece of it, and uh, and it, you can let us know along the way if you have questions or at the end. So the timeline. Wait, before we get started, I see Councilmember Larmer. You have your hand up still. Yeah, I was actually going to ask a question if we were still waiting for slides, but I can wait now. So that's okay. Good. All right. Thank you. And thank you to Kim for dealing with whatever that was. So timeline, you know where we are here at Community of the Whole, May 25th. It's been a long road. We uh, started this um, over a year and a half ago, and uh, we have a grant deadline of the end of next month. So we're very much hoping uh, to move forward with adoption. The adoption would actually be June 1st. There's a, a mistake on the slide here. So apologies for that. But um, the, if, if council is feeling comfortable tonight, that is the hope. So uh, you've seen the outline before. We're going to talk really briefly about each chapter. Uh, try not to bore you too much and um, just make sure that everybody is really clear about what we're passing and what it means for the future. So let's start with the introduction. You all know about House Bill 1923 that funded this work. It was about increasing residential building capacity. And our approach was to partner with our other South King County cities to form the South King Housing Collaborative, SOCIO, and combine our data collection efforts. So the first chapter talks about that. It also talks about just our general housing and zoning landscape, how much land is zoned single family, um, where people live, what the housing stock characteristics are, 
who the players are, you know, the city versus Skip versus the private development community, kind of a an intro of like, here are all the things that I've learned over the last few years to try to get everyone on the same page as we move forward. So the next chapter, and again, we've spoken with you about all of this, really about gathering data to inform the rest of the plan. So the, the grant required us to study population, projections, income, demographics, existing housing stock. And we also wanted to answer some specific Kent questions that we had related to regulate, regulated housing. And um, we also studied displacement as part of this chapter. So let's talk about it briefly. The next few slides have quite a lot of information on them. Not going to read it all. What I would like to do is just point out what's interesting to me, what sort of stands out to me from each of these little chunks of data. So that big red bar in the middle of the top right graph, I think is really interesting from the perspective of that's the scale of housing built by decade. That's multifamily housing at the scale of 100 plus units built in the 80s. The 80s were not a time known for especially quality construction. To <laughs> what you can imagine is that we've got quite a bit of this multifamily housing that's aging at this point compared to the single family housing, which has been relatively steady throughout the decades. So I'm gonna come back to why that sticked out to me on another slide. Um, let's jump to the next one where we see that um, the income distribution by AMI between 2012 and 2018 is also showing a, a sort of interesting pattern here um, where the 100 plus um, income demographics, which by the way, at the moment, 100% of area median income for a family of three is $101,000. So if you're a single person, 100% area median income is $79,188. If you're a couple, it's $90,500 or a, or a parent with a child or anything like that, two-person two household. So that 100 plus category is growing the most by far of any of our categories. And the other thing that sticks out to me here is on the bottom, the income distribution, you can very clearly see that owners are more likely to be in that 100 plus category and renters are more likely to be on the lower ends of the spectrum. So that really, um, it's not surprising. It tracks with how property ownership works in this country, but it is, you know, it's notable and it's, it's real. So let's go to the next slide. Here's why I wanna to touch back on that 1980s red boom in uh, 100 plus multifamily units. I kind of think there's a correlation. I'm not saying it's a one-to-one, -one, but the bottom bar in the bottom right-hand graph, the, the largest bar there, shows the um, number of units that are affordable to renters at the 50 to 80% AMI level. And in my opinion, that's likely a reflection of that 1980s building boom because that housing stock as it ages is likely renting for approximately this kind of middle of the road, not super low income. It's not deeply affordable, but it's not renting at market rate, right? Which would be closer to the 8,100 level. And so that is, um, that's what I think is sort of stark about that bottom graph again, is that we have this big, um, this big number of units that's available in the middle of that curve. So again, there's a lot of other info on here, but the last slide I just want to touch on kind of going back to that idea of the 100 plus, we need housing units at every level, every level of affordability. That is a truth. Um, the largest number of needed of units needed is at that 100% plus AMI due to those demographic changes that we saw in the previous slides. So um, that story that came out of Sokio, which again, it's a complex story. I, I'm simplifying it a lot of these moments just to try to um, shape the, the direction of the narrative for the purposes of the policy, but there's a ton of information in there. I hope you all have had a chance to read it. And um, we transitioned after that Sokio work to doing a little bit more of a regulated housing inventory. So. What we found is that, and we, we knew that this data was hard to come by, but we didn't know just how hard. The, the variation in, um, in the number there, 3,000 to 3,800, represents just how difficult it is to obtain really good information about regulated housing. But between consultants and our own internal work, we found that between 3,000 and 3,800 um, regulated affordable housing units exist today in Kent, which is about 25% of our multifamily housing stock, about a quarter. And the vast majority of those are subsidized at 60% AMI. And that's true for South King County as a whole. So that's the graph that you're seeing. Kent is the dark blue bar, but you can see that it's true for Federal Way and it's true for Auburn. Everybody's got a lot more 60% AMI than they do the lower end. So you can see that there is a portion of the population who is not being served well by uh, subsidized housing. And in fact, nearly half of units in Kent's downtown are subsidized at these 60% AMI levels and, and restricted to seniors, which is great 
for 60% AMI seniors. Like I am stoked that we are doing such a good job by which I mean shag and the other, you know, um, developments are doing such a good job of providing housing for that type. It does suggest though the beginnings of a concentration and are we providing a mixed income community for people to be able to live in? So that was some, some really interesting findings. We also studied development feasibility. What's shown here is um, a representation of basically the potential for middle housing. So um, when we looked at sort of what pet and why we, this is the consultants, because this is what we really need consultants for, is to tell us the behind the scenes numbers, the math reasons that some things can happen and some things can't. And the math really suggested that middle housing as compared to um, continuing to build the sort of multifamily that's been built or podium construction, which we can hope for and try to incentivize, but it, but financially it's we're not quite there yet. Middle housing is really, um, we have a high opportunity to accommodate growth by opening up um, our zoning to allow more of that middle housing type. I know you've heard us talk about it. We'll talk about it more, but this was another piece of the kind of data background that we wanted to have moving forward. And finally, we um, have some discussion in the plan in this chapter of displacement analysis, which um, you know is a, is a complicated topic. I think it's more complicated than a lot of people might want to um, acknowledge, particularly the link between gentrification and displacement is not always as clear cut as I think a lot of folks uh, might imagine. So um, what we really discuss in the plan is the need to do more displacement analysis on a case-by-case -case basis with our um, upcoming code amendment projects that result from this work because this PSRC map, as an example, um, we're not necessarily sure that we would use the same inputs as PSRC does or that this is really granular enough to be useful. So, you know, we wanted to do the exercise at the level that we're able to do it in this moment, but the plan really calls for more displacement analysis in the future, um, particularly as we go about making zoning changes to really see how are those changes going to affect people who live here today. So, that's chapter two. I'm now going to turn it over to Kayleen to talk about the next couple chapters while I take a drink of water. Thank you, Haley. Okay, so um, part of the KHOP analysis was to look at all of the policies that are on the books in the city and even how combinations of development regulations that we have construe a policy basis or policy direction for us moving forward. So in order to do that, we reviewed the comprehensive plan, all of our development regulations and all of the regional policies. And for the most part, the city's direction is in line with that of the rest of the region. We did find a couple places where we felt that small changes would better align the city's policy directions. Um, so I'll go through those real quickly. The notable areas for improvement in the comprehensive plan are to strengthen and add displacement language, re removing barriers, and ensuring that equity is a consideration that's made through every action that we do. And reflecting the comprehensive plan to be more clear on that is really important. It also is something that would help us align with the rest of the region because these displacement and equity strategies are a, a huge regional push. And so by doing that, we kind of hit two birds with one stone. And then also our development regulations. We have a lot of opportunity there for just changing the code that we have in place in order to make our development regulations a little bit more comprehensive and enable a little bit more construction. Uh, so next slide, please. And I know that I've come talk to you guys about this many, many a times because it's my pet, but um, I'll talk a little bit about the outreach because there was three different phases of outreach. Um, so next slide, please, Kim. The first portion was the KHOP outreach, which is the outreach conducted by myself and Haley. We came and presented to you about this before, but we had three live public meetings, a survey, and then when we didn't get the results that we anticipated or diverse enough of results, we went out and did two focus groups. And what we heard was this interest in middle housing, accessory dwelling units, cottages, duplex, um, more affordable rental housing, and home ownership. A lot of things that we could do to better increase our multi-generational housing stock and a lot of information on displacement prevention. Uh, next slide, please. 
while we were conducting our outreach, um, there was mobile home park outreach that was happening in tandem by our consultants, Burke Consulting. Uh, their outreach happened around the same time uh, from December through around March. And they did an owner questionnaire, resident questionnaire, one-on-one -on -one interviews. They ran some spots on, um, on the radio in Spanish and uh, they sent out a notice. So they did a lot of outreach and got a, a huge variety of information. We've digested most of that of, in the plan, but but I think the biggest part uh, was is this sense of community that mobile home parks have that we weren't necessarily aware of and a need for us to focus more on education for tenants rights and responsibilities. Uh, next slide, please. So up until this point in our presentation, we've kind of inundated you with lots of data. <laughs> And all of the data and all of the outreach culminated into an extensive list of strategies. We have come and talked to you about the extensive list of strategies. Um, so we're not going to go through all of them, but in the plan, we prioritize them from low to high and then implementation timelines of near to long-term. And so while we dive into each, stra each strategy in the plan in depth, we'll go over some of the more promising ones again tonight. All right, so I'll talk about the, the first four and then I'll hand it off to Haley again to talk to you about the rest. Um, so three, the kind of big three are the middle housing code amendments, multifamily code calibrations and TOD, which is transit oriented development along the I line. All three of these kind of really go very nicely in tandem with one another. Uh, the middle housing is this resurgence of housing types and neighborhoods that were more common pre-World War II. Um, and when we are referring to middle housing, we are meaning um, some anything between an apartment and a single family home. So duplex, triplex, fourplex, ADUs we're including in there. Um, and as Haley mentioned earlier, there's a, a lot of potential uh, for middle housing feasibility. So we have a lot of potential to incrementally increase density in single family zones while maintaining single family neighborhood character. And where are some of the places that we might be able to do that? In the areas around TOD or adjacent to more um, multifamily neighborhoods. So we've got um, a lot of strategies specifically broken down about that. And while the I-Line, however, is not traditional um, like TOD, we think that it's a great opportunity for us to look into along the I-Line to kind of calibrate the special middle housing and our multifamily code standards to ensure that we're, we're getting the kind of development that we want to see up there. And then next slide, please. Uh, another strategy that we addressed was kind of came out of this outreach that we did, which was our partnerships with CBOs. And the city already has formal partnerships with 75 CBOs and, and 90 more partnerships. But what we learned is, is that if we build more robust partnerships or collaborate with CBOs that are serving our jurisdiction in different ways, not only how we learned in our outreach during this, but what we will continue to do for our policies moving forward and kind of honing in on that equity and displacement piece and making sure that we're getting um, CBOs who are interested, perhaps providing them training. Uh, so there's some really good strategies in the plan about that as well. And so that will be the last one that I'm going to talk about and I will hand it back to Haley. Thank you. So um, we have heard from uh, Burke Consulting, Dawn Couch came to our workshop uh, at City Council a few weeks ago, but this is the first time that I've really gotten a chance to talk to the City Council about mobile home park preservation study. So I will just spend a, a few minutes on this and then uh, we'll keep moving through the plan. So the study that Burke can, um, contributed to us is now an appendix to the plan. And what we wrote in there were really our sort of findings and next steps. And so, you know, with 26 mobile home parks in Kent and potentially over 5,000 residents, you know, there's a lot of variation. Uh, that's definitely one of the findings. Some of them are very well maintained. Some of them are not very well maintained and many of them are in the middle. So our strategy is focused on displacement mitigation and home replacement, um, that translation issue that Kayleen mentioned regarding educational materials um, for both tenants and owners, um, and then this need for a really compassionate and nuanced code enforcement strategy, um, focusing potentially more on like overcrowding and fire risk than maybe like rote uh, compliance, and potentially exploring an inspection program similar to the rental housing inspection program. So. I'll talk more at the end about um, the folks who came to speak about this at the public hearing, but for now, I'll just say that I think that the plan does a really good job of setting us up to take action without dictating exactly which actions uh, those need to be. Uh, specifically, there's no 
this first, then this, then this. It's really a menu of all of the possible things that we can do. And we will plan to come back to city council as we continue to digest the information from the consultants, continue to speak with stakeholders and come up with what do we want the next steps to be? So very similar to the other strategies such as you know, the multifamily code calibration or ADUs or middle housing, we know that we have opportunity here. We know there are things to do. We have an idea of what they might be, but we haven't scoped an exact project, right? Because this was sort of about listing all of the possible projects that we might do in the next few years, not so much about um, scoping what specifically will happen next. So I did want to be clear about that because I know there's a lot of energy and interest um, around the mobile home park uh, issue. And I want to um, make sure that everyone knows that, you know, we're not dictating right now what's going to happen next. We're really more focused on, uh, we were focused on learning and now we're focused on giving ourselves permission to move forward um, and, and, and do more. So there are so many other strategies in the plan, like way more than are even listed here. This is just another handful that we've again talked about uh, with council for the most part. And um, there's probably even another dozen or, or so besides, but for now, let's move on to probably the shortest chapter, which is funding. Um, I can't remember if we've spoken about this, but I, I think it won't be any surprise to council that our key takeaways on funding were really this need to pool funds. So um, on the next slide, Kim, uh, we can see just a couple of those takeaways that the need to pool these new sources from the sales and use taxes, both 1406 and 1590. I don't know if anyone's given them more personable names yet, but that's still how I think of them. Those are great potential sources to pull from. And some of the other potential sources like levies seem a lot less promising in Kent, uh, given some of our outreach and as well as, you know, previous levies uh, that I think this council is probably pretty familiar with. So uh, we just did a bit of a discussion about that because we do know that funding helps, you know, funding helps um, effectuate good outcomes. And so we wanted to make sure to address that. So finally, what it all points to are these policy objectives that comprise chapter seven and sort of chapter eight as well. And I actually was not able to share these with council previously because of that, that evening there was that technical difficulty where uh, we ended a little bit early. And so I am going to go through these again in just a little bit of depth, hopefully not too much, um, just so that you're very aware because this is really what the document is, is most clearly adopting. This is the policy direction for the city to move forward. And so what I think of as being useful about policy is that anything we think we might want to do in the future, we want a policy basis to do it in this plan. So um, we have quite a few specific policies. They don't, they're not all listed all on the next slides, but we list examples of, um, of the kinds of actions that happen under each strategic policy objective. So let's start with the first one, which is preserving those affordable housing options in Kent today while preventing and mitigating displacement. This is about streamlining those processes for assistance, um, educating and, and translating our materials so that people know um, what, you know, what options there are today, what resources exist today. It's about continuing to be, um, you know, so forward thinking with our rental housing inspection program. It encompasses the mobile home park preservation piece that we um, that we learned about. Uh, it talks about monitoring efforts that SKIP is doing and our, our desire to partner and contribute to that and advocating for legislation as well. Um, there's, I think, nine or 10 in this group, so that this is not all of them, but that these are sort of the main themes. For, for strategic policy objective two, uh, which is to make it easier to grow Kent's housing stock while increasing housing variety and choice, this is really about that um, middle housing uh, code and those code changes that Kayleen was describing, as well as boosting home ownership. Um, it, that's getting at that idea of choice and variety, removing barriers that are you know, prohibiting us from seeing more diversity, and then um, sustaining downtown and, and that multifamily tax exemption program that we have on the books today, and, and, and including actions that talk about updating or adjusting it as needed in the future so that we're not we're not stuck with what we have today. The third is to leverage and expand partnerships to further housing related goals. So this is where I really want us to be at the table, um, helping shape the housing that is coming to Kent by partnering with CBOs, as Kayleen described, partnering with SKIP, partnering with the development community, um, you know, basically playing a more proactive role rather than sort of waiting for permits to come in and then wondering why um, the housing all looks a certain way. This is really about, um, being out there and communicating with those impacted by housing and with those building housing to be that middle role between those two camps to help translate the needs and um, you know, the opportunities between those groups. 
And finally, number four, similar to number three sh about sharing Kent's housing story, it's a little more um, maybe political, but it, I think it has similarities because this is really about collaboration with our South King County subregion and making sure that folks understand South King County housing issues. I really have noticed over and over again, I was literally on a phone call 10 minutes before this meeting explaining to SCA some of Kent's housing story and how ill understood that is. So proactively communicating with PSRC and the state legislature, having relationships with King County decision makers in a variety of different settings, really advocating for us regionally and um, you know, continuing to explore our housing story. This is not the whole thing. This is not the be all end all of everything. It also means, you know, we know we have diverse needs. Can we understand them better? Can we continue to hone and refine um, Kent's housing story to make it more and more relevant and meaningful and impactful? So chapter eight takes all of those and really just puts them in a very complicated table with times and um, responsible staff and metrics of success, trying to really hold ourselves to some standards to say, what, what, what does it mean to say we want to do this? When, who, that kind of thing. We won't go into the tables now. Um, that's the plan. Last couple slides here are just about what has happened since the plan was published. Um, so we did get Department of Commerce approval. Uh, that letter um, to, was addressed to the city council um, by the Department of Commerce. They had a few suggestions for long-term monitoring and potentially more funding, which is interesting. Um, but in general, they were very complimentary. So we were really pleased about that since we have not yet submitted for reimbursement <laughs> and we wanted to make sure that they were going to do that. Um, and finally, I wanna talk a little bit about the land use and planning board um, hearing that we had. So the vote was unanimous. So that is uh, you know, kind of the, the simplest way to talk about it, but the public comments, um, were um, interesting from the perspective of we got a letter ahead of time because one group of people, the Association of Manufactured Homeowners, was not able to attend. And so they sent a letter, which we addressed on the record. And I apologize if folks have seen the public hearing video, um, then this is, you already know about this, but I just I wanted to tell the council in case folks haven't seen the video that um, the public meeting comments for people who actually came to speak um, represented park owners mobile home park owners. And so um, all of the public comments were about the appendix, that mobile home park study appendix. But um, I will just say that I think it's possible that folks from the Association of Manufactured Home Owners may come to council uh, next week to give public comment during the general public comment period, because I let them know that that's always an option. And I know that they were um, not upset, but perhaps disappointed that they were not able to attend and speak in person or uh, live rather. Um, at the public hearing, and especially because the park owners were able to speak at the public hearing, you know, there was a little bit of back and forth between me and the park owners. And I think basically what's happening is, you know, we're exploring an issue that is personal to people and that people have a stake in. And so both homeowners and park owners are kind of on high alert because they're like, oh, my issue is finally being talked about and I want to come share my feelings about it. They did not have any um, changes that they were suggesting to the plan. They did not have any um, major, I would say they didn't have any major criticisms, certainly of the plan. And I think there were a few issues with the study where folks didn't maybe like a tone of how something was um, was represented. But I will also say that, you know, the proactive park owners who might be coming to speak or who might be responding to the survey are maybe um, a little bit of a different uh, creature then the park owners who are not responsive and maybe not as proactive, and you might imagine not as um, likely to be doing amazing maintenance on their parks. So I'm interpreting a little bit, but my uh, my read is that some of the park owners may have felt misrepresented by being lumped in with some of the less responsible park owners who own parks in Kent, because I think the folks who came um, in general, had, perhaps were owners of parks that were in the well-maintained section and didn't really like being lumped in. So that's my read. That is not necessarily how they would identify themselves, but I did want to just let council know about that situation. Let me know that I feel absolutely no concerns about what we've heard because these are stakeholders that we will continue to engage with as we move forward with this work. I don't know exactly what our next steps are. And that's actually exciting to me because we now have so much information. It was not really possible to just immediately know what was going to come next. And that means that we have time to talk to these people and to talk to council and to figure out 
what makes sense to do next? Because we've got a whole lot of interesting issues. They're they're varying throughout the city, throughout the city's parks. And I think that, um, you know, I, I, I just want to promise, I guess, that we will work with folks no matter what. And so um, I think council can feel confident moving forward th- with this plan, regardless of if folks come to, you know, city council or, or want to email, or I don't know if anyone's gotten emails or anything, or, you know, have, if there's opinions being aired about this, that's all good. <laughs> you know, that all allows us to move forward. So as long as we pass this plan and are able to get through this piece of work, then we can really start addressing what we're hearing. And I, I um, you know, we'll just, again, um, promise to do that in a way that takes these perspectives into account. So I want to be really clear about that with council because, you know, I think these issues are sensitive and they're personal. And, um, you know, I think looking into something always kind of raises people's, um, you know, their hackles up a little bit and they're saying, what are you going to make us do? Or what are you not going to make us do that I need them to do, you know? And so we, we heard a little bit of that. But again, they really were not criticisms of the plan. I think the plan stands very well to um, move us forward to address those things. So that I am happy to answer any questions that I know Kayleen is as well. Thank you. Kaylee and Kayleen, thank you so much. This is such a great presentation. Um, so much information that um, is useful now and into the future. So I just want to thank you and your team because I know how much time, well, I don't know how much time I'm imagining this took a lot of time to um, put this all together. And then you've been so generous to meet with us and answer our questions and keep us informed. So kudos and thank you so much. I am going to start with Council Member Michelle. Thank you, Council President. Haley. This is great. I really appreciate your presentation and matching your outfit to your presentation is <laughs> bonus points. Um, so I'm wondering, I've only made it through chapter five. I haven't finished. I'll finish my next week. Um, I'm wondering if this plan addresses or you came across anyone while doing your public outreach where they're not huge fans of growing Kent's population and um divisions and that sort of thing. Does this address those concerns at all anywhere? Good question. Um, we kind of took an approach with the outreach of sort of default educating that like this is about growth. So I think that through doing that, we may have weeded out somebody who like wanted to have that philosophical debate. Um, you know, I think in general, we almost always anywhere we go here, people who are kind of saying, well, how much more growth are we talking here? So I wouldn't say that we didn't hear that in any way, but it's not a major theme. And that may have been because, you know, the grant was about increasing residential building capacity. It's like, it was right there in the name. And so we, we wanted to have productive conversations with folks. So we really led with all the graphs that show the population growing, you know, and it was like, we need to keep growing. The question is how, and I think that the responses we got were largely on board. And so maybe that was somewhat self-selective, but maybe it's also that as folks, you know, are educating themselves about these issues, they also have, you know, it come to everybody eventually comes to the realization that you can't put up the wall, no matter how much we all may personally want our own wall for peace and quiet. <laughs> All right, any other questions or comments on this? Council Member Larner. Yeah, so Haley, awesome job. Great, you know, this has just been, you know, really exciting to see this come to fruition and all the work you guys did from the time we approved the funding for you guys to go ahead and go forward and put this together. So um, thank you for all that work. And then um, Haley, I know that you and I had a discussion um, about an am- amended language. So I'm assuming that I still need to uh, move that. That has, was not updated. So it's something that I'll need to make a motion for tonight. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Council President, I have just a slight wording change to one of the strategies. So let me know um, when it's appropriate to uh, suggest that. So that so one of the in one of the chapters is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, um, let me pull up the specific number. It is SP zero one dash eight. I just um, wanted to move that we amend it uh, to change it from applying for rental assistance to seeking housing resources, and then at the end of that amend uh, for all housing related information geared towards both tenants and including those seeking rental assistance and landlords. 
the idea uh, just that uh, here was that um, you know a lot of the uh, housing information, you know, I don't know how much in the past we've made available to landlords for their own understanding as well. So I think that, you know, is something that if we were to put together housing, uh, a resource portal, uh, that we should have information as well for landlords to help them understand their rights and responsibilities as well. So is that something, Haley, is that just for, just updating the wording in your plan? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think my opinion was that that would generally be supported by the plan, but we didn't call it out. And in, in fact, hitting landlords was not specified anywhere. So um, council members, uh, council member Larmer's request was to specify it. And so I kind of helped choose where I thought that best um, belonged, which is under that strategic policy objective number one, um, action number eight. And so um, I can read the two versions, like the original and then the amended version, if that's helpful. Um Actually, can I do that? I think I can do that. Um, so I think the original was streamlined processes for people mm. applying for assistance to ensure equitable access by exploring innovative partnerships and technology solutions, including but not limited to a centralized online location managed by the city for all housing related resources. I think that's what was resources. Um, and the reason there, so we mentioned this centralized online location but the, the original policy sort of about seeking rental assistance, which is quite specific. So I think that Councilmember Larmer's suggestion actually strengthens the policy. So here would be the revised language. Streamline processes for people seeking housing resources, right, of any type, to ensure equitable access by exploring innovative partnerships and technology solutions, including that limited to a centralized location managed by the city for all housing-related information geared towards both tenants including those seeking rental assistance and landlords. So it, it broadens it and includes landlords in a way that I, I would agree is, is helpful. So that um, if, if the council agrees, we can make that change within the plan and it can still go on next week. Um, but if that needs further discussion, then I think um, this would be the time to have that and potentially also next week if needed. Actually, okay. Madam, so, Madam Chairman, point of order. Okay. If I may. There are actually probably... Madam President, there are actually probably two ways to do this. One is to have the motion made first and seconded. Then amendments can be put forth. Or if there is no real problem with any of the council members, you can we could take it as a friendly amendment, which is probably what I would do. And you might verify that with Pat, but I think that would be the two ways to do this. Well, and I think at this point, this is just making a change to the plan that we have before us. So I don't know, Derek, if you can chime in. I think um, we don't need to take action on this. It's just, if we all not just agree, um, you know, as far as committee of the meetings, it's just to kind of agree and have a consensus on things to, to put forward. So I think if we all agree that that wording is okay, we can just move that forward. So yeah, so that'd be um, a friendly amendment. Okay. Yeah. So is everyone okay with um, just having Haley update that language? Okay. All right. So we will, um, Haley, you'll just update that. And then um, that will be in the packet for next week as well. Councilmember Fincher, you have your hand raised. Yes, I was just going to look, but I was only going to speak in support of that, of making that change. Uh, in conversations with property managers and landlords, it wasn't only the tenants who didn't know their rights, but also a lot landlords and property managers did not know the basic laws that applied. So uh, yeah, that was what I was going to say. So thank you. Great. That makes perfect sense. Councilmember Michaud. Sorry, I was thinking you were unmiking there. All right. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Um, and then um, just a consensus, is everyone okay? Haley's gonna make that update um, to the language and moving this forward to consent calendar. All right, wonderful. Thank you again, Haley and Kayleen for all your hard work. Um, we are happy to move this forward. Thanks. Have a great night. Um, next up, I'd like to welcome Pat to talk about um, our ordinance for the 40-day termination of month-to-month -month rental agreement. I and get, also yeah. require action. Sorry about that. Um, good evening, Council. I hope you can hear me okay. 
Um, I'm before you today with a, with an ordinance to undo something you just did. Um, so the ordinance before you uh, is to repeal chapter 1003 of the Kent City Code. And this is regarding the landlord tenant regulations that you recently passed regarding month to month, rather period to period residential agreements. Um, so if you recall, uh, you recently passed an ordinance that would add an additional uh, 40 days to the 20 day state law requirement uh, before a landlord uh, could terminate a month-to-month uh, -month rental agreement. And um, this is a quick reminder, um, the ordinance was passed by the council uh, because of the short 20-day notice period and the difficulty um, in tenants' ability to find housing quickly. So that was the genesis for our ordinance that the council passed. Um, it was very forward thinking because after you passed your ordinance, the state legislature then passed a, a very comprehensive amendment to the State Landlord Tenant Act. Um, and the amendments at the state level have basically resulted in the need uh, for us to repeal the ordinance you just passed. Um, so just to be real brief on the state law and gross substitute house bill 1236, has two major impacts to the ordinance that you just passed. First of all, the 20-day timeline in state law that formed the basis for Kent's ordinance was completely eliminated as it applies to landlords. So in the past, landlords were able under state law to give 20-day notice to a tenant. That has been eliminated. And in its place, state law has established a just cause uh, agreement termination process whereby um, a landlord cannot terminate a month to month lease without just cause do for doing so. And most of the timelines in the state law now, the, the state law establishes a number of basis that form, or a number of things that form a basis for just cause, such as failing to pay, uh, pay rent, a substantial breach to a material uh, requirement of the uh, agreement, um, uh, selling the premises. And the issue here is that most of those timelines involved are longer than the total 60 days that you had basically established by the ordinance. Um, I would note there are a couple ex of exceptions, which this council did talk about, not wanting this to, wanting the Kent ordinance to apply to, the most prevalent of which is a tenant's failure to pay rent. Um, in prior discussions with council, uh, um, the, the um, conversation of council was, well, we don't want this long horizon for removing a month-to-month um, -month tenant to apply to tenants who don't pay rent. And that has been accomplished under state law. Um, it's a little bit surprising um, what, what the legislature did here. I think that it may result in potentially the complete elimination of month-to-month rental agreements, um, but uh, the law is what it is. But right now, the way our ordinance stands, there is a conflict between our ordinance and state law. And so uh, in my opinion, from a legal standpoint, it's, it's re I mean, I can't tell you what to do. You're the legislative body, but I strongly recommend that you repeal your ordinance. So I can field any questions if you have them. Council Member Lamer, you have your hand up. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Pat, is are there any of the are any of the time periods assigned to any of the causes not covered in ours? I mean, is there any gaps at all, or is across the board everything covered and better than ours? In my opinion, um, so so if we go back a number of months when there was discussion about following. Uh, what other cities had done for just cause uh, ordinances. Um, the, in my opinion, there were there were some good parts and bad parts of those particular ordinances, and every city was different. The state law just cause provisions are very very comprehensive. Um, it covers substantial breach of a material program re requirement for subsidized housing. It require it it covers what happens when premises are condemned. Um, some of those are shorter. Some of those are only 30 days. But for example, premises that are condemned by a local agency, there's a 30-day time horizon. 
for removing a tenant in a month to month lease. That's a really tricky issue to deal with because you might really need that person to be out now because, you know, depending on what the basis for condemnation is. Um, so, um, so, you know, I, I think that it's very comprehensive. I don't see any holes to this. I think it's a, okay. it's a, it's a pretty stout program that the state passed, very protective of month to month tenant rights. My fear is that it's so comprehensive that, that landlords are not going to be having any type of lease that either converts to a month to month um, or just renting straight up as a month to month um, program, but that's not something we can control. The other thing I would suggest is that um, consistency from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, in my opinion, on something like this is really good. Um, it doesn't, you know, so somebody who's moving from Auburn to Kent or Kent to SeaTac, and everybody has a different way of dealing with this. I think it becomes really confusing for tenants. And this area is already very, very confusing to tenants and to some landlords. But um, so to answer your quick uh, question, long winded answer is I think everything's covered here. Great. I appreciate that because I, I have been contacted by a few residents who saw the agenda item and were questioning why we were repealing this. So I just wanted right. to be really clear. We are repealing it because we feel like the state law is more protective than what we had drafted. That, that's my opinion. And we also need to repeal it because we are now in direct conflict okay. with and we're in conflict in a way that um, is not helpful to tenants, in my opinion. So we're more exposed than, for example, Tacoma or Burien, both of whom, and Seattle by that, uh, for that matter, all three of whom are in federal court dealing with lawsuits right now. So I think we have a bigger target on our back. Um, so, um, so there we are. Okay, appreciate the analysis. Thanks, Pat. Yep. All right, any other questions for Pat on this? All right, so we would move this forward to consent. Is everyone okay with that? All right, thank you so much, Pat, appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, next up is information only on the closure of 100th Place Southeast to motorized vehicles and uh, vehicle traffic, and that's Terry Youngman. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon, uh, council members. I'm coming to you tonight with a brief presentation, kind of two parts to the presentation. You know, because the, uh, Proposed closure of 100th Place Southeast is sort of inextricably tied to the work in Mill Creek Canyon. We thought appropriate to just come and give a general update on everything that's happened over the last several months in Mill Creek Canyon, give you a glimpse into the work that's happening kind of within the Parks Department and with our, our contractor looking forward, some of the work in the near-term horizon there, and then how that ties in with this proposed road closure. I am joined by Rob Brown from uh, Public Works Transportation tonight. He will be able to help answer questions related to the right of way and transportation uh, related, but I'm gonna sort of lead us through this presentation now. So let me take a moment to share my screen. Okay, is that coming through okay for everybody? Perfect. So yeah, as I said, I'm presenting tonight on the 100th Place Southeast Permanent Road Closure and a quick Mill Creek Canyon update. So talking through the work that has happened over the last few months in Mill Creek Canyon, you know, the work for the cleanup started back in September of 2020. Uh, that feels like forever ago at this point, but we've made uh, a lot of progress in really what is a short amount of time in Mill Creek Canyon. The way we approached the cleanup because of the significant steep slopes and uh, challenges to access the canyon, we took it on in phases. And so the areas that you see, sort of the different colored areas along Mill Creek Canyon, area one, two, three, four, and so, and so on, really represent the, the, the phases that we took on the cleanup effort of the canyon and various mobilizations to these, uh, to these areas with dumpsters and uh, crews and trucks and things like that. Uh, so we're happy to announce that as of May 14th, we are, are wrapped up in the, the cleanup phase of the canyon. Uh, to date, we have expensed approximately $690,000 on the Clean Harbors contract that was all work related to uh, the cleanup of camps, trash, debris, uh, you know, various dumping that has gone on at the, the creek's edges. 
uh, and has ended up down deep into the canyon. Uh, some statistics on that removal, uh, we have removed 100 tons of trash from the canyon. It was a very stark number, 100 tons of trash and 350 shopping carts as well. Um, you know, just sort of anecdotally, uh, we've been spending a lot of time in the creek walking through these existing trails. And I can tell you from my experience and being in that canyon before the cleanup effort started and being in the canyon now, it is a night and day difference. The, it, we have a beautiful resource right in the heart of downtown. Uh, you, can't, you, you get the sense of being in deep nature, uh, especially now that all the trash has been picked up. It's not to say that we don't have the occasional camp that reappears or trash that needs collection, uh, but the bulk of the work has really been done. We've hit the reset button on the canyon, and this was really the starting point for all the work that we have to look forward to there. So really excited to announce all of that. I just have to take a moment to um, uh, highlight the work of Brian Higgins, uh, who is one of my project managers, who has really done all the heavy lifting and the managing of the contract with Clean Harbors. And so I have to give major kudos to him and all the work that he's been doing and all of our operations crew and they're uh, adapting to uh, some of the additional work of, of moving through this canyon with regularity. So looking forward, um, this took a, quick, a few quick photos that kind of show the progress, you know, um, they, they really tell the story. These are photos of the Clean Harbors crew and some of the work they're doing. This is just an example of the types of things that we would encounter uh, in the creek. You can see these steep, steep, um, steep banks make it very difficult to get this trash up and out. So really a tremendous amount of effort to, to remove this trash. Uh, and then some after photos. Um, you know, again, I just want to highlight the, the amazing natural resource that we have right here in the heart of downtown Kent. Um, so we've recently installed some signage as well. Uh, that signage points you to a website where we're updating uh, information on uh, what has happened in the canyon and then what to look forward to as far as uh, future trail renovations, activations, and eventual, you know, master plan update. So looking forward sort of in this near-term horizon, the things we have look, to look forward to now, uh, we have recently gotten under contract with EarthCore. EarthCore is an extension of AmeriCorps. Uh, they specialize in restoration and uh, sort of ecological restoration and trail work. Uh, we are very interested in their services as it relates to trail repair and maintenance. They have come on board kind of under a design contract with us and are giving us a complete assessment, collecting GIS data and giving us a complete assessment on the, uh, the trail system within Mill Creek Canyon, documenting what's there today, and then coming up with a prioritized list of uh, repairs and maintenance needs. Uh, so that we can begin to chip away uh, at, at these needs and reestablish some sections of the, uh, the Mill Creek Canyon trail system that are reaching uh, an unsustainable state. Um, now that we are kind of on the tail end of this analysis phase, we're starting to work with them on what the first round of repairs would look like. Uh, and we are currently sort of negotiating a contract with them uh, to be able to start phase one of trail repair work this summer. So really excited to announce that. We're moving pretty quickly. We don't want to lose the momentum that we've gained by uh, taking this uh, cleanup effort on, uh, um, you know, taking the bull by the horns there. And so we are gonna be moving forward with uh, the first round of repairs this summer. That first round of repairs is really focused on the section of trail from Earthworks Park. So you can see it here uh, where I'm highlighting with my mouse. So to get from Earthworks Park along this trail and then up to the American Legion Hall, that would be the first phase of, of repairs that we would be taking on and sort of clearing that corridor, reestablishing the tread and, and uh, dealing with any ongoing erosion issues and things like that. So that's kind of phase one. Uh, we will be taking on uh, additional phases of this work every season. You know, it's best to do this kind of work in the dry season. So we're really taking these opportunities in the summer. So we're going to do phase one now. Next year, we'll do another phase and so on and so forth until we are able to make our way all the way, all the way through the entire canyon. EarthCore is not the only people doing work in the canyon. Parks, Parks Maintenance uh, has really stepped up. Uh, to the challenge uh, of maintaining Mill Creek Canyon. You know, our crews are in there doing routine walks of the canyon, checking for camps if they're back in places that we've already cleaned up, doing trash cleanup. 
Um, and you know, some of the work that we're looking forward to is getting our crews connected with the Earth Corps crews so that there can be a learning experience as they're reestablishing some of these trails and doing some of this repair work. You know, for our crews to be able to watch that work and see how they how they go about uh, uh, doing the work and the methodology and the different materials that are used is really going to equip some of our crews to be able to do some of the similar work, perhaps not of the same scale that Earth Corps can do, but at least to, to learn from them in that process. We're looking at our maintenance crews uh, potentially starting some of their own vegetation clearing uh, late in the summer, or early fall of 2021. So that's just kind of a general update. I see a hand that popped up. Councilmember Thomas. You're muted. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> hey, Terry, so I'm reading this right now, permanent road closure. Is that permanent, permanent? I mean, I, mean, I use that road nearly every day. Uh, are used to, I mean, but um, it's gonna be gone. Yeah, let me jump into that part of the presentation. So what we're proposing is to close uh, 100th place Southeast permanently to vehicular traffic. So it would still be open for bikes and peds. Uh, we would create uh, a recreational corridor through this stretch of 100th place Southeast um, but to close it from vehicular traffic. Now this road has been closed for the last several months, as this was a really yeah. challenging situation for us in terms of staging uh, for Clean Harbors and their contracts. You know, we did not have a good location to get a dumpster for them to park vehicles for us to be able to get that trash up and out of the canyon. So it was a little bit of a test run, a pilot on what the closure would mean uh, to the, the transportation sort of traffic flows. And I think what we're seeing is that it's not really having a substantial, uh, is not a detriment necessarily uh, to, to access uh, for vehicular traffic. Um, and so this is what we are proposing today. So that road is currently closed in a temporary state because of the ongoing cleanup work in Mill Creek Canyon. And what we're proposing is to take it from a temporary closure to now a permanent closure and, and to open that up as a recreation corridor um, and and provide some additional opportunities for connectivity for the surrounding uh, neighborhood and residents to get into Mill Creek Canyon. Thank you. No problem. So yeah, these maps kind of give you a sense of where we are. Uh, Mill Creek Canyon is here. Uh, the the target building is here. Uh, and then where, where we are actually proposing the closure would be where 100th place meets 97th. Right. And then where it makes the turn here is where the closure would stop because there are some private residences and some other residential housing that extends along 264th. And so I'm seeing some hands pop up and I'll take those questions. We will start with Councilmember Mershoff followed by Councilmember Core. Thank you, Council President. Okay, Terry, so I guess I never realized this was actually a road. I thought it was just like a, like a way to get behind the building. So there, if we were to, to close this off, would there be parking at each side for people to use the trail? I think if with this initial closure, we would probably not do parking now. I think we need to go through the master plan update and think about strategically locating parking overall within Mill Creek Canyon before we start making parking decisions because parking is great. We know that we need more parking within Mill Creek Canyon, but it can also cause nuisance issues. And so that's the thing. We don't want to jump to add parking and then create other issues that we didn't anticipate. I think what we want to do is well, let's close this thing permanently for now. And then let's see how we can activate it through some recreational use. And then through the master plan update, potentially look at ways that we could add parking here or other locations within the Mill Creek Canyon corridor. Okay. And to answer your, your first part of your question, there is another access this is has this is within the development but there is that access road that goes behind these businesses that runs directly parallel to 100 place southeast so there is a road and there's also that access for the for the businesses okay so i guess i've never been on this road so if the council president is okay um i wonder if um council member thomas can talk about like how often he uses that road daily so, Councilmember Thomas, you're driving behind the target? I go down 
I guess it's called 100th Place uh, Southeast. Uh -huh. It's a real quick turn off to go to my road on 104th, make a quick right because uh, there's no stoplight. And uh, yeah, it's nice. I mean, it's not going to be terribly mm -hmm. inconvenient. I mean, it's been that way now for a couple of months. However, what one quick question uh, mm -hmm. while I got you on, if that's okay, Madam President? Uh, sure, go ahead. Thank you. Terry, all along 97th Place South now, the grass is about two feet and a half feet tall. I don't know if you noticed that or not, which I don't know if that's a parks department problem or. Okay. I'll let you deal with that though. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll be sure to pass that on to our operations crew. So that, that grass, if it's on the Canyon side, I think it would be a parks department. Maintenance it is. Facility. So it yeah, is. I'll get that. I'll get that comment on to our operations team. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilmember Thomas. And Councilmember Michelle, just to kind of, um, you know, that road that's back there, because um, I used to shop at the Top Foods, and of course that target's right there, but it's my understanding that a majority of people, unlike Councilmember Thomas, that use that kind of as a shortcut, um, tend to go back there and dump things and do probably things that aren't um, supposed to be done back there. So a lot of that would eliminate um, a lot of issues with, um, you know, we've just spent so much time as you heard cleaning up that Mill Creek Canyon and this would um, give people that continued access to go back there and, you know, dump their mattresses and things like that. So um, I, you know, I support this. I think that, um, you know, this is the right thing to do at this point. So and I am going to turn now to Councilmember Core. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, for the presentation. Uh, my question is, did we, during the temporary closure, closures, did we hear any complaints from the neighbors? Did we? Yeah, I actually have a, I have a few more slides in my presentation. It might be helpful for me to just run through these really quickly, and then we can come back to hands because I, I may be able to answer a lot of the questions that will come up. So let me just, let me just kind Thank of you. run through these pre uh, slides really quick. So just wanted to give a, a glimpse into the existing condition. This is 100 Place Southeast uh, on the left-hand side. It's actually a really beautiful corridor, nice tree canopy, a narrow road. Um, what had what exactly as uh, Council President Troutner had pointed out, this was a very uh, dense uh, dumping area for us as we were moving through the canyon. And the slopes drop off dramatically. And so although people may be dumping on the side of the road, what happens is it just falls off and then it eventually ends up down in the canyon. And then it becomes an even worse problem for us to get that trash up and out. So the idea is, can we close this road off, activate it in a positive way, prevent the dumping that was happening along this corridor uh, and turn a negative to a positive? That's the idea. So then the picture on the right, this is just one example of uh, some of the things that we would find along this corridor. This is, you know, half of a car um, and, and other mechanical pieces. And so this is just gives you a sense of the kind of trash that we would find down in the canyon. Uh, so then moving quickly, as far as process, we are not vacating right-of-way. We are closing a road. It will remain right-of-way. Uh, it's just a matter of blocking it off physically. Um, so the temporary closure of 100 Place Southeast was announced on social media, Drive Kent, and posted in the Seattle Times. That's the closure that's there today. After that was put in place, we sent out letters uh, that explained the proposed permanent closure to residents uh, between 100 Place Southeast and 104th Avenue South. So these are those residents that would be most directly affected by the closure. We received four total responses uh, from the letters that were sent out. I would say that all of the people who responded were generally supportive of the idea of 100 Place Southeast. Um, they recognize that it's a constant issue of dumping and um, a negative use that goes on there. We did receive two responses where uh, residents had concerns about the safety of the Southeast 264th Street and 104th Avenue Southeast intersection. It can be a very challenging intersection to turn left. Uh, so we were sure to send those responses on to uh, our transportation team. That's something that's on their radar. Uh, but those were the only negative uh, comments that we got. In addition to the outreach to private uh, residents, we did meet with uh, the business owners, on-site managers uh, for all of the commercial property that's directly adjacent to the place southeast. Uh, we sent letters, we sent out maps explaining the closure, and generally we had a positive reception from the business community as well in the area. Um, so moving forward, this is an information only item for tonight, so there's no action necessarily, but if 
council is comfortable with this item uh, moving ahead through the process, we would be posting this in the Seattle Times. And then from that point, we would be doing a permanent uh, closure. And then I can kind of walk us through what that would look like. So as a case study of what it could be, uh, I thought it appropriate to point to the Meridian Glen Park uh, project that was recently completed. This was a couple of years ago. Um, so we did a park renovation. One of the things that we identified as we were doing the park renovation is that it had a dead end street uh, directly adjacent to the park was creating a lot of the similar issues that we're dealing with at Hunter Place Southeast, dumping people, parking cars, doing things that they shouldn't. Um, and so we saw an opportunity to activate that street end, that dead end in a positive way. We worked with our uh, partners in public works, came up with a concept of how we could block off that uh, dead end road, uh, worked with utility companies to make sure they, they had proper access to it, and then worked with one of our consultants to draw up a little plan that activated that street end in a positive way that was a low cost, uh, but a high recreation value return. So the end result, the finished condition was we installed ecology blocks along the front edge of it. Those ecology blocks have signage, reflective tape. So these are all the measures that we would put in place to keep cars from running into these things at night. And that's all. these are all things that we're working through our public works team to make sure that it meets all of their standards for things in the roadway and crash, uh, crash test safety ratings and, and things that I don't know a ton about, but I know who to talk to in order to get that kind of information. Uh, so it has all of those things. Uh, like I said, bollard access for maintenance and utilities, and then paint on pavement is cheap, right? To do these types of things is not a, a major investment, but the positive use that it creates uh, is really, uh, really quite brilliant. So um, we've seen a lot of use out of this facility at Meridian Glen. All the neighbors are very happy with the investments that were made, and it's cut down on some of the negative, the negative use that was seen there at that dead end. And so I think what we would look at uh, for 100 place would be similar. I think the treatment along the front would be similar to what you see here, ecology blocks, bollards, signage, reflective tape. What we do within the corridor, I think will be different in the near term. I think we really just want to activate it as a trail. Bikes and peds, make sure that people can use it. And then I think we would come through later with some positive recreational uses that you kind of see here today. Foursquare, hopscotch, I think a little bike course makes a lot of sense for that space, but I think we want to take some time to think through what the best options are, probably get a consultant under contract to help us with that sort of stuff. So yeah, I'll stop from there and then I'm happy to answer any questions. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Terry. Sorry that we interrupted you so much, but we did to the end. Um, Council Member Fincher. Thank you. My first question was on the last section. So you mentioned that parks, but our parks teams are going through the park. So I wanted to know, is that going to continue? And is that seen as a permanent feature? Wondering what's gonna be done to inhibit the recreation of camps in the park. So that was one. I'll let you answer that one. Yeah, so the, the short answer is yes. Our teams are now, you know, I think fully committed to maintaining Mill Creek Canyon. Uh, I think there's been some recent resource uh, allocation, some increase to our budget to, to handle that additional task. Uh, we've had a recent hire who uh, has really taken this thing on um, and is developing good process for how the canyon will be monitored and what frequency. And uh, so I'm, I'm seeing all of that action and it's all happening. And so I feel good. We also have a better process, I think, for camp cleanup. I think we know exactly how to do these things and how to stay on top of it and not let it get out of control. And, and I think, you know, we on the parks capital side will continue to help. I think positive activation, repairing uh, trails and getting people into the canyon, that's gonna be our ticket to success with the Mill Creek Canyon. We gotta get people back in the canyon using it for positive recreational use. If we can achieve that, I think that we will be able to sort of keep the negative uses to a minimum. Well, and that leads into the next question. I was wondering, we, we have people in the parks who can uh, see now. So I was wondering, have we seen with the nice weather, have we seen more people on their bikes, mountain bikes, and doing different activities in the park? You know, I am so glad you asked that question. You teed it up perfectly. Um, when we were doing our hike with Earth Corps through the canyon uh, a few weeks ago, I saw hikers in the canyon. And it was it was really sort of like this eureka moment. It was like, 
there are people here. People are coming back to the canyon. They're in small numbers now, but it just it takes people telling friends and telling neighbors that yes, canyon is clean again. It has good trails. You can get in there and use it. So yes, we are starting to see more people in the canyon. And I would predict as we make more and more investments, we will see that positive use go up. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Fincher. Councilmember Thomas. Thank you, Madam President. So Terry, uh, two questions real quick. Are they ever going to restore the steps that led off the Kent Kangley? There's a little parking area, and then the steps went down the stairway, went down to the, you know, earthworks. That, that's number one. No, I don't believe we're going to put those back in place. You know, okay. I think that those create those have their own inherent nuisance issues associated with them. So no, we will we will okay. not. Okay. Yeah, I kind of heard that. Uh, second, and this is kind of more like what. Uh, Councilmember Fincher asked, while you've been down there, have you noticed wildlife? And I don't mean rats, I mean deer. Uh, there's one bear been snooping around, I guess, down in that area, coyotes. Uh, is you this know, something I, you've noticed? I'm not creeping around in the canyon at night, which is, I think, the time period you'd see most of that kind of activity, but there are definitely signs of wildlife in that canyon. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Okay, thanks. Councilmember Michaud. Thank you, Council President. Terry, thank you. This presentation was really, um, really nicely done. Pretty. Um, okay, so I have never been down that road, I guess. It looks really beautiful. I'll have to go check it out. Um, I mean, I've lived here a long time, not as long as um, Council Member Thomas, but I've been, lived here a long time and never even realized there was a road there. So. <laughs> I guess I'm okay with it. And it looks really pretty to where I want to go. And then Terry, I'm wondering if maybe you could give us a tour of the canyon sometime during the day. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll work with, um, yeah, I don't know who I'll work with, but I would, I would love to set that up. That would be great. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, Terry, hopefully you got some good information. Uh, a great I, job, thank you. Yeah, and so we'll be moving this forward to the Seattle Times. Thanks so much for your time. Wonderful, thank you. All right. Agreement with Jacobs Engineering Group for the Green River Natural Resource Area Stormwater Pump Station project requires action. So I believe Toby's here tonight. Yes, uh, thank you, Council President Troutner and uh, members of the committee. I'm Toby Halleck, Senior Environmental Engineer with Public Works Engineering. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. I'm here to discuss the Green River Natural Resources Area North Pump Station and a consultant services agreement with Jacobs Engineering Group for the design of the pump station. Uh, the uh, picture you see here is the Green River Natural Resources area looking to the south. It's a little bit of a different angle than you may have seen it before. Uh, and flowing towards you would be the outlet channel from, from the Green River Natural Resources area. South 212 Street's on the bottom of your screen. And the star is showing the proposed location of this new pump station. The next slide shows the uh, more more seen uh, picture, just an aerial view with north pointing up of the Green River Natural Resources Area, or GRNRA, uh, which is still a mouthful, but just makes it a little shorter and easier to say. Uh, but uh, the GRNRA is a regional stormwater detention and enhanced wetland facility in the heart of the Kent Valley. It's 304 acres in total area, leaves it as one of the few remaining open spaces in our city's industrial valley. It's generally bound by the Green River to the west, 64th Avenue to the east, South 212th Street to the north, and the Puget Sound Energy Corridor Trail to the south. Uh, in this map, it's shown highlighted in green, and again, the star is showing the proposed pump, pump station location. So not only does the GRNRA collect stormwater from the streets and businesses in Valley, it also receives high flows from Mill Creek, uh, the same Mill Creek that flows down the canyon that Terry was just talking about. Uh, one of the main inflows to the GRNRA 
is from the 64th Avenue channel to the south, which is shown at the bottom of the map. Uh, recently, there was a stormwater pump station uh, built at 64th Avenue and James Street. This was to help relieve some of the water that's flowing into the, into the GRNRA. Uh, then the diversion channel shown on this map takes water from Mill Creek, and this helps reduce flood risk in the valley along Mill Creek such as uh, the areas along 76th Avenue, where we've recently done a lot of work near the Blue Origin site. Uh, inflows to the GRNRA get routed through a series of ponds to help clean the water where it flows through an outlet channel at the north end, which we saw on the first slide. And then it flows to the Boeing Channel. The Boeing Channel flows to the east and then to the north where it reconnects to Mill Creek. When the GRNRA was originally designed, a pump station was planned to help push water downstream out of the ponds to allow for more stormwater storage during rain events. Uh, when it was first constructed, budget constraints caused the pump station portion of the project to be postponed. While we know water flows downhill, we anticipated that the uh, water would be able to find its way out of the GRNRA, and uh, it turned out that gravity wasn't as effective as we thought. Uh, it turns out that the valley uh, from the south end of Kent to the north end is about 5.5 miles, and the elevation drop is only about 25 feet. That's about 0.09% of a slope. So this results in the GRNRA ponds holding more water than what they were designed to hold, which effectively lessens its flood storage capacity by about 25%. These two pictures were taken in the middle of the summer, uh, just this last summer, with um, after weeks without rain. The picture on the left shows the outlet channel looking to the south, and the picture to the right shows the Boeing channel looking southeast towards 12th Street. This stagnant water just sits here and barely moves. Uh, water flows to the north through through the valley, and it barely moves at all through this this section of of the uh, Boeing Channel. A pump station in this area will help this ponded water evacuate out of the GRNRA ponds, which would free up more volume for incoming stormwater, and this will help reduce flood risk in the Kent Valley and in downtown Kent. <laughs> We propose to partner with Jacobs Engineering Group. We have uh, performed a selection process and Jacobs Engineering Group came out on top. By partnering with a firm that has the expertise that Jacobs has, the city will receive a superior product. The city has partnered with Jacobs Engineering Group on a number of other successful pump station projects recently. The GRNRA South Pump Station, as I mentioned before, along 64th and James Street, has been constructed as an, and is operational. The Washington Avenue Pump Station is currently under design current uh, at this moment. With uh, these projects, we've learned what we can and can't do on our own. And so we are able to build this scope of work to include precisely what we will need from our consultant and handle what we can in-house to help conserve funds. I appreciate you having me here to present this consultant services agreement for your consideration. Thank you for your time and have a great evening. Great, thank you. Anybody have any questions about this? All right, is everyone okay moving this forward to consent? Thanks, Toby, for joining us. Thank you very much, Council President. Move that forward to consent calendar and then move on next to the uh, 2021 Street Sweeping Service Agreement with McDonough and Sons. And Bill Thomas is here tonight. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam President. Good evening, Council Members and Mayor Ralph. I'm here to talk with you a little bit about the street, uh, City of Kent sweeping program, as well as the City of Kent sweeping contract. You know, when I first started, uh, they handed me a broom, a shovel, and a couple of buckets that told me to go out and sweep around those traffic islands. Of course, traffic these days is a lot, lot uh, worse. So, uh, fortunately, in the 80s, we started contracting our regular sweeping throughout the city. Currently, the city has approximately 476 miles of curb and gutters that need to be swept at various times throughout each month. 
within the gutters, we have about 20,000 catch basins, just under 20,000 catch basins. In the past, it was more about appearance of the streets. Now, not only about appearance, but more about the environment. National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or commonly known as NPDES, requires that at least 95% of these catch basins are to be cleaned every two years. And just last year, 3.5 million pounds of debris was swept from our streets. That's quite a bit of uh, material. The more debris we remove, re the more debris we remove from the streets and gutters before it enters the system, the less time is spent cleaning them. In 2011, the frequencies for sweeping our streets was analyzed to see if we were sweeping too much or if we were sweeping too little. We found that we could reduce our sweeping in certain areas, thus reducing overall costs for the contract. Currently, we have three areas with different schedules. The downtown core area gets swept twice per year, price, sorry, price twice per week. Certain arterials are swept once per week. Residential suites, streets are swept once per month, January through September, and twice per month, October through December. We have three types of sweeping. We have regular uh, scheduled sweeping, which I discussed on the previous slide. We have extra sweeping, which includes emergency calls for spills, debris left over from accidents, and sweeping for our in-house projects. Premium sweeping is performed every fall when leaves drop from the trees and fill our gutter lines. These sweeps usually last about three to four weeks. So the current contract is a three-year agreement with two option years. We currently are, we are currently in our final option year and is set to expire June 30th. In April, we advertised for sweeping proposals. We've received two proposals. McDonough and Sons Incorporate, Incorporated was low bid. Monthly billing will be $20,250. Extra sweeping cost is $55 an hour. Premium sweeping at five cents a lineal foot and contract administration runs about 6,000 annually. This sweeping contract is funded through the Storm Utilities Fund. So we recommend council authorize the mayor to sign a street sweeping services contract with McDonough and Sons Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $20,250 per month plus premium and extra call out charges for street sweeping services to the city. This contract will be a three year agreement with two one year options. So with that, I will answer any questions. All right, anybody have any questions about this? All right, is everyone okay moving this forward to consent? All right, great. Thank you so much, Bill. And I'm glad you got all these sweepers now so you don't have to do all that work. Right on. Thank <laughs> you. All right, moving on. Uh, Summit Landy Landsberg Road, uh, Puget Sound Electrical Agreement. Um, and Stephen Lincoln, you've got the next two. So let's take them one at a time. Uh, actually, I, I, you, I, do, uh, oh, you know what, let's do them both at the same time. That would be great. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Council it's all messed up now. Oh, <laughs> uh, not only I can, I, I can swing it. Uh, <laughs> uh, Council President Troutner, uh, members of the committee, good evening. I'm Steve Lincoln. I'm a slightly less senior environmental engineer with Public Works Environmental. Uh, tonight, I am presenting a pair of agreements with uh, Puget Sound Engineering uh, regarding relocation of their facilities uh, outside of city right-of-way on our uh, Rock Creek culvert replacement at Summit Landsberg Road. Uh, both agreements are uh, meant to cover reimbursement for uh, PSE's work occurring inside King County right-of-way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as shown on the slide, uh, there is a portion of the city of Kent located outside of Maple Valley, surrounded by uh, unincorporated King County. Uh, the project site is not far from the intersection of uh, Maple Valley, Black Diamond Road, and uh, Kent Kangley Road. Uh, this uh, portion of the city is principally composed of the Clark Springs watershed, where uh, a city water supply is located just south of Kent Kangley Road. 
On peak days, this facility can provide uh, well over half of the city's drinking water supply. And uh, the culvert replacement project that we are conducting is located, uh, is denoted by that orange star on the uh, lower right picture. Uh, next, thank you. Uh, in 2010, the city entered into an agreement with uh, National Marine Fisheries Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to implement a habitat conservation plan for the Clark Springs watershed. Uh, in exchange for the uh, uh, engaging in this plan, the uh, federal agencies agreed to support our continued uh, continued usage of water rights at Clark Springs. The Habitat Conservation Plan consists of a collection of habitat conservation measures, uh, the last of which remaining to be completed is the replacement of the Rock Creek culvert at Summit Lansford Road. Uh, the existing culvert, as uh, can be shown on the picture on the right, is, uh, is uh, not does not currently meet WDFW fish passage criteria, which are intended to provide for free and uninterrupted passage of adult and juvenile salmonids. Uh, the three existing 36-inch uh, diameter corrugated null culverts will be replaced with a 55-foot span bridge, which will meet WDFW fish passage requirements. As part of this project, uh, the PSE gas and electric facilities will have to be relocated. Uh, this, il this slide illustrates a view of Summit Landsberg Road from the, uh, at the proposed bridge location from the point of view of an eastbound motorist. Uh, the approximate locations of the existing overhead electric line and underground gas line are shown in red and orange on this slide, respectively. Uh, PSE intends to relocate their facilities by means of a directional bore, placing their relocated gas and electric lines within a casing going underneath the, rock, the reestablished Rock Creek stream bed. Uh, in this profile view here, you can see the uh, PSE relocated li uh, lines in, again, orange and yellow. Uh, because portions of this work are uh, will require work in unincorporated King County, north of the uh, the city's jurisdictional line, uh, we will need to compensate PSE for that work that is not covered by our current franchise agreements with PSE. Uh, these uh, the reimbursement is already covered under the uh, budget for the project take, uh, coming from the city's water fund. Uh, also, as an update on the project, we have obtained all the necessary permits and property rights needed to conduct the project, and as of today, this project is now being advertised for bidders. Uh, due to procurement time of the bridge girders, we will be beginning project, uh, construction of this project in June 2022, but this PSE work will uh, be uh, is planned for this summer. Uh, additionally, we are in process of negotiating a similar agreement with Comcast also for a directional bore, and we should have that in front of the committee sometime in the next several months. Uh, this uh, concludes my presentation, and I, I thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, describe the important work we're doing on this project. Thank you very much, and you're true. That is a really important project. For those of you that have not been up there to see that, um, that whole area, it's um, pretty cool. All right, anyone have questions on this? All right, so we've got two agreements before us. One is uh, they're both with Puget Sound Energy for the relocation of the electrical and the gas. Everybody okay moving them on to consent? All right, we will move them on to the consent calendar then. Thank you so much, Steve. And last but not least, we've got the South 212th Street Preservation from PSRC. Love to have grant money coming in. So Drew, let us know what this is all about. Thank you, uh, Council President Trauner. Uh, good evening, Council members and Mayor Ralph. Um, as Council President Troutner mentioned, I'm here to talk about the 212th Street Preservation Grant where we've received additional funds from PSRC. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, PSRC, is the Puget Sound Regional Council, and they uh, initially awarded us $1.4 million for an overlay project on 212 to repair the fa failing pavement there. And we've since bid this project and it has been awarded and PSRC had additional funds this year and noted that our project would be able to use those funds. So I'm here to ask for you if you're interested in accepting an additional $700,000 which can be put towards this $3 million project. 
bringing our total grant funds from PSRC to $2.1 million. Um, next slide, please. This project is gonna repair the pavement that's in bad shape uh, from two uh, on 212th Street from 72nd Avenue South to 84th Avenue South, which is East Valley Highway. So we're essentially going from the concrete intersection at 72nd Avenue to just to the intersection, uh, to the crosswalk. Uh, we're not going into the crosswalk, but on East Valley Highway. And uh, the green dots on the map in front of you are curb ramps that we will be repairing. Um, of note along this section, there's the interurban trail crossing where we'll be repairing those curb ramps and bringing those up to speed. And then there's also a BNSF and U Union Pacific Railroad crossings along this stretch of pavement. Next slide, please. Uh, this is part of a bigger project. Um, you know, we're hoping to redo, we're, you know, we're aiming to redo all of the pavement along 212th. And this map kind of shows where we're looking, where, where, what we've done so far, and then a couple future segments. Next slide, please. Uh, well, there was supposed to be one more, but that's okay. Uh, the next slide's uh, basically just talking about our relationship with PSRC, and um, we've been pleased to receive a lot of funds from them. And you know, this additional funding that they're giving us is really a testament to our working relationship with them. And uh, we have a good relationship, and we'd like to keep a, keep that relationship going. And, and we're doing that by bidding the projects, and you know, designing and bidding the projects on schedule and getting them out the door. So. Uh, I bring good news, and, and that's all I have for you, unless you have any questions for me. That is great news, Drew. What is the timeline for this? Did you mention when this project will be starting? I did not. Thank you. Uh, good question. We are currently going to have a pre-construction meeting uh, later this week, and I believe we'll get a start date soon. But, uh, you know, constr expect construction to start June, uh, June to July and, and take a month, one to two months. Perfect. Anybody else have any questions about this? All right, we need to move this forward to consent. Is everyone okay? All right, great job on securing those funds. That's really helpful, especially for big projects like this. So thank you very much. We will move that forward to consent. Thank you for your time. Have a great night. All right, that brings us to the end of our discussions this evening. Um, everybody go um, enjoy this little bit of time that we still have left in our day. Um, have a great evening and we will see everyone next week. Take care. We're adjourned. Thank you.